My name is Jane McCausland, and I'm going to be filling in for Pastor Trish this morning. Uh, before we get started, would you bow with me for a short prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. Reverend David Owens began a sermon with this following short story, and I'd like to share it with you today. This is a story that is told of a preacher and a New York City taxi cab driver who both died and went to heaven. And St. Peter was at the pearly gates waiting for them. Come with me, said St. Peter to the taxi driver. And the taxi driver did as he was told, and he followed Peter into a beautiful mansion. It, it had everything you could ever imagine, a bowling alley, an Olympic-sized pool. Wow, thank you, said the taxi driver. Next, Peter led the preacher into a rugged old shack with a bunk bed and an old television set. Oh, wait, Peter, I think you got a little mixed up, said the preacher. Shouldn't I be the one who gets the mansion, not the taxi driver? I mean, after all, I preached God's word and I served God every day. I preached God's word every day. Peter said, yes, that's true. You served God and you preached God's word. But during your sermons, people slept. However, the way the taxi cab driver drove, people thought they were going to die any minute, and they made all kinds of prayers and commitments to God. <laughs> so hopefully today you'll be able to stay awake during this sermon. Now right now, I'd like you to, in your mind, or you can even jot it down on your bulletin somewhere, write down or think about who are the greatest examples of men from the Bible. Just think about that for a few seconds. Who would you name as the greatest examples of men from the Bible? Now, I would like you to raise your hand if Ezra was on that list. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> well, I'm hoping that by the time that today's sermon is over, you would maybe at least consider putting Ezra onto that list. So as we begin our study of the scriptures this morning, we're going to be introduced to this man named Ezra, and we'll get a chance to see what kind of an influence he had on God's people. And I, first, of all, uh, first of all, I'd like to give you some background to his story. Now, Ezra was a priest, a scribe, and a great leader. His, his name actually means help. And he dedicated his entire life to serving God and to serving God's people. And he is um, said to have written most of First and Second Chronicles, the book of Ezra, the book of Nehemiah, and Psalm 119, which Alan read a portion of Psalm 119 to us this morning from uh, our uh, morning scripture reading from the Psalms. The book of Ezra begins by Ezra telling us of the return of God's people to Jerusalem after 70 years of being in exile. Under the leadership of Zerubbabel, in 538 BC, about 50,000 Jews left Babylon and returned to Jerusalem. The re purpose of their returning to Jerusalem was in order to rebuild the temple. And the temple was restored and completed in 515 BC. So the first six chapters of the book of Ezra are dedicated and to telling that story of what happened during that time. These things all happened before Ezra was even born. But then in chapter 7, at the very beginning of chapter 7 in verse 1, Ezra starts off that chapter with these three words, after these things. And this statement then allows Ezra to kind of fast forward in time, and he takes us up to 60 years later, which was when he was living. And so the, the remainder of the book of Ezra is written in the first person, as though he's telling it about himself. 
<clears throat> so in chapter seven, we get introduced to the scholar slash priest that was named Ezra. And we learn that his lineage could be traced the whole way back to Aaron, Moses' brother, who was the first high priest of the Israelites. So someone wanting to become a scholar slash priest in the Jewish religion, they couldn't have had a better record of descent than that. So now Ezra knew that the temple had been rebuilt but he also knew that the lives of the people in Jerusalem, it was a total state of disorder. I mean, their lives were in shambles. And that was because God's people had intermarried with foreigners who were opposed to believing in God and worshiping God. So Ezra started praying and he prayed and asked God, how can I help these people? And then he took action. Ezra was prepared to do whatever it took to be able to take a group of Jews back with him to Jerusalem and help the people of Jerusalem to restore their original relationship with God. As Christians today, we need to refuse to allow ourselves to follow and be drawn into the compromising positions that the world's lifestyles lead us to. And instead, like Ezra, we need to align our lives to obeying God's commandments. We need to also pray and ask God for his guidance, and we need to be willing to study, to follow, and most importantly, to take action, to teach God's word. So Ezra's first move was to go to King Artaxerxes and to ask for a decree stating that any Jew that wanted to could return to Jerusalem with him. Now the decree was supposed to be a sort of a passport that they could take along with them on their journey back just in case they ran into any opposition along the way. The king granted a very generous decree which showed that God truly was blessing Ezra and his request that he had made. It's also an indication that Ezra was probably a very prominent man in the king's eyes and in Artaxerxes' kingdom. Ezra was actually willing to give up this position of prominence in order to be able to lead these people back to return to their homeland, to God's people, to be able to help them to see what God's laws were. And so we're going to take a look at King Artaxerxes' letter to Ezra. <clears throat> this is from um, chapter 7, verse 11. This is a copy of the letter of King Artaxerxes that, that King Artaxerxes had given to Ezra the priest, a teacher of the law, a man learned in matters concerning the commands and decrees of the Lord of, for Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest, the teacher of the law, of the God of heaven. Greetings. Now, I decree that any of the Israelites in my kingdom, including priests and Levites, who volunteer to go to Jerusalem with you may go. You are sent by the king and his seven advisors to inquire to, yes, to inquire about Judah and Jerusalem with regard to the law of your God, which is in your hand. Moreover, you are to take with you the silver and gold that the king and his advisors have freely given to the God of Israel, whose dwelling is in Jerusalem. Together with all the silver and gold you may obtain from the province of Babylon, as well as the freewill offerings of the people and priests from the temple for the temple of their God in Jerusalem. With this money, be sure to buy bulls, rams, and male lambs, together with their grain offerings and drink offerings, and sacrifice them on the altar of the temple of your God in Jerusalem. You and your fellow Israelites may do whatever seems best with the rest of the silver and gold in accordance with the will of your God. 
deliver to the God of Jerusalem all the articles entrusted to you for worship in the temple of your God, and anything else needed for the temple of your God that you are responsible to supply, you may provide from the royal treasury. Now I, King Artaxerxes, decree that all the treasurers of trans-Euphrates are to provide with diligence whatever Ezra the priest, the teacher of the law of God of heaven, may ask of you, up to a hundred talents of silver, a hundred cores of wheat, a hundred baths of wine, a hundred baths of olive oil, and salt without limit. Whatever the God of heaven has prescribed, let it be done with diligence for the temple of the God of heaven. Why should his wrath fall on the realm of the king and his sons? You are also to know that you have no authority to impose taxes, tribute, or duty on any of the priests, Levites, musicians, gatekeepers, temple servants, or other workers at this house of God. And you, Ezra, in accordance with the wisdom of your God, which you possess, appoint magistrates and judges to administer justice to all the people of trans-Euphrates, all who know the laws of your God. And you are to teach any who do not know them. Whoever does not obey the law of your God and the law of, your king, of the king must surely be punished by death, banishment, confiscation of property, or imprisonment. So we can see from reading this scripture, this portion of scripture, that the king had great respect for Ezra and for the God that Ezra worshiped. He not only fulfilled Ezra's request for the Jews to have the safe passage, but he also provided gold and silver and free will offerings with which Ezra was able then to buy various animals and grains for offerings of sacrifice to God once they got there. And so the king set forth a decree that went above and beyond anything that Ezra had ever asked for. Isn't this the position that we find ourselves in so many times when we send up a request to God? We send up a request to God for something, and we find so many times that we are blessed beyond measure of, with things that we didn't even think to ask for. Now let's read on a bit more in cha from chapter 7. This is verses 28 and 29. Praise be to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, who has put it into the king's heart to bring honor to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem in this way, and who has extended his good favor to me before the king and his advisors and all the king's powerful officials. Because the hand of the Lord my God was on me, I took courage and gathered the leaders from Israel to go up with me. Here in these two verses, we discover that Ezra praised God for all that God had done in him and through him. Ezra had honored God throughout his entire life, and now God is choosing to honor Ezra. Now, because of the king's decree, Ezra could have thought, oh, well, it was because of my great prominence and because of my charisma but instead of thinking of those things as the reason that he was being blessed by the king, Ezra gave the credit all to God. He did not accept it as his own. And that's the way that we should be. We should always be grateful for our successes, but we should never think that they are only as a result of our own power. Ezra and the people traveled for 900 miles and for four months to make that journey. The trip for them was very difficult and it took them through some really dangerous places. But the people prayed to God for a safe journey and God honored that request. Our journey today, the things that each one of us is going through, it may not take us through dangerous lands like it did through with Ezra, 
but we need to recognize our need to do the same thing. We need to rely upon God's guidance and God's protection daily. Now, before setting out on this entire journey, Ezra prepared for everything that he needed physically, took all the necessary things along that he would need on the journey. But more importantly, he prepared himself spiritually. Ezra and the people prayed and fasted. They were showing their dependence on God for protection, and they were prepared spiritually for this trip before they left. Their faith in that God was in control and their affirmation that they knew they would never be strong enough to make it on their own should be an example for us today as well. We need to put God first in our lives. And when we totally rely on him, we too will receive God's guidance and protection. There are some really important lessons that we can learn from this Bible lesson today. Ezra devoted himself to study and observance of the law of the Lord. We need to read God's word as well each day, and we should be studying God's word, taking a closer look at it, as if with binoculars, and sharing it to all who will listen. Ezra's heart was devoted to God. He prepared his heart to seek, to do, and to teach God's word. For Ezra, simply studying God's word, that was just not enough. And it shouldn't be enough for us either. Ezra listened to what God had to say, and then he didn't just listen, he took action, and he obeyed God's word. Many people know God's word, and some of them can even quote it to you fluently. But there's a big difference between saying God's word and simply knowing it and quoting it and actually doing God's word. In James 1, verses 22 to 25, we learn, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone looking at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Ezra made it his mission to know and to do God's word. But not just that, he devoted himself to teaching God's word to others. And I'm sure there are probably some of you saying right now, oh well, teaching really isn't something that I'm very good at. But let me share something with you. This is a quote by William J. Toms, quote, be careful how you live. You may be the only Bible some person ever reads. Jerry has put this message already down on the sign down near the road. Do you realize what that's saying? Our actions speak louder than any words that we will ever say. Others see us all the time. They see us in the best of times, but they also see us in the worst of times. And the way that we respond to others and the things that we come up against, that speaks volumes as to where your heart is standing with God right now. I'd like you to listen to some advice that Paul gave to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Ezra also devoted himself to prayer and fasting. Fasting is simply giving up one good thing for something better. John Pfeiffer wrote of fasting, fasting is for times of yearning and aching 
and longing. As we pray and fast, we are seeking a more intimate walk with our God. One of the Bible's best examples of prayer and fasting is found in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. And I'd like to read that to you right now. This is called Jesus is Tested in the Wilderness. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell the stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand at the highest point on the of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor. All this I give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. So Jesus spent 40 days and 40 nights fasting and praying before he even began God's work for him here on earth. He needed that time alone to prepare for what God had for him to do. Jesus was able to resist the devil's temptations, not only because he knew scripture, but because he obeyed scripture. In Ephesians 6, 17, it says, God's word is a sword to use in spiritual combat. Knowing Bible verses is a very important step to resisting the devil attacks, but we must not only know the scripture, we must be obeying that scripture as well. I mean, if you take notice, Satan memorized scripture, but he failed to obey it. Knowing and obeying the Bible helps us to follow God's desires for our lives. We can't force the hand of God or the favor of God, but if we walk obeying God's word and communing with God each day and prayer and fasting, he will surely have his hand upon us and in all that we do and say. Lastly, we must remember that we can do nothing of significance without God. But with God, we can do all things that God wants to accomplish through us. This lesson today is as much for me as it is for anyone else. And as I look at my own life, I can see that I need to grow in some of these areas as well. Be devoted to God's work. Go before God in prayer and thanksgiving and fasting. Be dependent on the hand of God to lead me each and every day. How about you? Like we saw in the opening story, becoming a New York City taxi driver may not be the best way to influence others to be making a commitment to God. But following Ezra's example, it surely will. Will you please bow your heads for a moment of prayer with me? Lord, some days I've failed so miserably. Please forgive me. Help me to be more devoted to your work. Help me to come to you in prayer and fasting, lifting up my needs and my requests to you. Help me to rely on your guidance in all that I do and to always give you glory and praise. In Jesus' precious name, amen.